Podcast, your one stop shop for everything you don't need. IO's atmosphere has exploded, companies are taking over the moon, and Wikipedia has unlocked the secret of free will. I'm your host, Kevin Giese, and joining me not because it was preordained, but because he freely chose to, it's Alex Bragdon. Alex, how are you doing? Good, but I'm here not against my will. Oh, okay. Well, that means podcast <laughs> over. Bye. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in. Goodbye and unwelcome to the Code Monkey Podcast, your one stop shop. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write copy for that. I, we don't. We don't have an outro. Oh, do we want an outro? I don't, it should, should we probably just up? be like. Uh, I'll make one Kevin up doesn't like Interstellar. <laughs> yes. Oh wait, we mentioned Interstellar. End of podcast. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. How so many I, episodes I, have just ended because? And it's, it's not even like we intended to do this. It's just it comes up randomly, and then hmm. I don't know what just happened. What did something just happen? You disappeared for a good chunk of time. Oh, no. Okay. Well, that's not I good. That, I think that was internet, to yeah. be honest. Um, well, I am... I'm on good internet. I don't know. It could just be Skype. Let's just continue. Okay, we'll continue. We'll continue going on. Yes, um, we sometimes don't like Interstellar. I sometimes don't like Interstellar. You sometimes, heckle me for, you sometimes heckle me for it. And then the universe moves on. But how, how has your week been, other than being obsessed with Interstellar all the time? <laughs> I'm not obsessed with Interstellar all the time. That's only like half the time. All right. I did watch at least two videos about Interstellar yesterday, though. So, <laughs> you know, maybe this is a poor baseline this is, for this is for your my, standard. This is your standard weekly dose of. Yeah. Although it's going to be a lot more up next month because next month I'm going to go see it in 70 millimeter again, uh, and I'm super excited about that because it is it shot still in, it's still in theaters. Well, no, they but they. I live in a hipster town with like seventeen million theaters. Ah, uh, okay. So they're also showing it's a mad, 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 mad world, which I'm super excited to go see. <laughs> okay. Uh, and like two thousand one, in all off the original films, like so. I'm super. So excited here's about the thing about Interstellar, and I don't want to be the one to break this to you, but some uh-huh. of the stuff was not actually shot on seventy millimeter. It's actually special yeah, I, effects. I, I, yeah, I, I know. It's some not. really scientifically accurate special effects too. Uh, who knows? I know. Hypothetically, I, scientifically pump. accurate. We'll get into th- so. we'll get into this. We actually, no, we will not. Get, you did not add it to the show notes. We will not get into this. <laughs> did you not read the <laughs> notes I've added? You've you've not added. Oh, maybe I need to refresh. If you probably <laughs> added like eighty stories. I don't know. No, I mean, no, just, I ha- just, no. You haven't added anything. Yes. Look. I, look. Look. That's the, the thing. You added the thing the, that you added the thing about determinism. Right. Expand that. Oh, the, ah, stupid expand! Oh my gosh! Okay, yeah, Alex has Alex has, has done his fair fair amount of show notes things. We'll get there. We'll get there. All right. Uh, before we do that, yes, um, as as was briefly alluded to by that weird pause when Alex was like, "I'm confused. What just happened? I'm recording on a new machine." <laughs> yes, yes, you are. Uh, I am. I am recording on this Windows machine that has been a disaster. <laughs> As all Windows machines are. Well, well, this is why. Why? I don't know. I don't work for Microsoft. I do know someone who does work for Microsoft. Do you well, want me to call them? Tell them, them up? to get their stuff together, man. I think they work on the Office team, so uh, oh, they probably don't know either. Then they are yes, they probably don't know anything about computers. <laughs> um, oh, burden or users or anything. Oh man, Office. I have yeah, I have thoughts about Office, but mo- I, I think we all do. <laughs> I think we all have thoughts, <laughs> pleasant thoughts. Um, yeah, so I, I'm Alex. I'm I'm still in blue screen of death hell. It's slightly well, no. less blue screen of death hell. You can boot now. If I remember correctly, yes. last week you couldn't boot. Yes. So, but but for no particular like it just started to decay. <laughs> like it's not well, it's not like I changed anything and then it got to the point where like I'd, I'd t- try to turn on the computer and be like, hey, we didn't even try and start Windows, but Windows is already dead. Um, and, but it just, it got to that point. Yeah. So since then I removed, um, a PCI card that was just mm-hmm. for importing, um, external video signal, which I wasn't really intending to use for a while anyway. Yeah. Um, I also tried today to remove, uh, to, 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 to remove the Wi-Fi card and just use a USB Wi-Fi dongle. Mm-hmm. I since got very mad about that because the USB Wi-Fi dongle is nothing is like 
a PCI Wi-Fi card with its <laughs> antennas. No. The USB Wi-Fi dongle, it seems it's, it seems perfectly fine on a Raspberry Pi. Mm. <laughs> but man, when you're like, hey, mm. I need to download this 20 gigabyte video game, it's not quite up to the task. And so I got frustrated, I put it back in. Yeah. So my recommendation is probably to buy a, a wireless router that you can flash like Linux onto and then just have that connect with its giant antennas and then you have ethernet ports ethernet ports that is a good point although i think i actually can route i'm, I'm debating whether or not to route the uh because i do have my own internet now i can i believe route it into this room i just need to actually do that um, there's a switching yeah. port behind a wall and i need to and the guy was nice he's like show me like hey yeah if you ever do want to switch stuff up you know just whatever do the thing here and um you can move the uh, the modem over to somewhere else and everything will be wonderful so I may just end up yeah, going to a wired connection. Hopefully things will be better then. I approve of wired connections. I actually, when we moved into this place, I wired up the house for 10 gigabit Ethernet. <laughs> uh, what is your you, broadband capacity? Like, what is... Uh, my broadband capacity has 200 megabits per second. Okay. Um, and I actually don't have anything using the 10 megabit or the 10 <laughs> gigabit connection, but the wire in the wall totally supports it. Um <laughs> So I could theoretically connect two computers across the entirety of the house. Well, theoretically, you could just put fast. a RAID then on your network and then just yeah. deal with it that way. Because yeah. it's fast enough. I mean, the, the biggest problem is that 10 gigabit switches are like $800. And well, gigabit yes. switches are like $8. So, yeah. like, it's absurdly expensive. So just wire 10 of them in parallel? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, by that point, you need to bond all those channels together, and you'd probably need, like, an $800 router to bond okay, 10 well, gigabit signals together. That is fair. So, it's kind of a moot point. Well, so, so my machine is now at the point where I'm trusting, I'm not trusting it. I'm trying. I'm not trusting it either. <laughs> I'm trying this podcast to, will be eight minutes long, exactly. but, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm doing my best to just try and use the thing. And then try and see if maybe I can come up with some way to force it to crash. Because it still now occasionally gives me these blue screen and death errors that I can't seem to debug. I have a new power <laughs> supply coming in. Maybe. that Like, in a, in a uh, no idea. Maybe that'll fix things. Yeah. Uh, maybe. It won't. It won't. It, it, Nothing it will fix this. This it will might. just be how the computer is it, forever. This was- the power supply was like the one thing you've kept from that old broken computer, right? That's, yes, is there, that is true. So you, why not? Like now you have a totally brand new computer. Yes. So now everything should work. Fine. It means that I can be even more indignant when it doesn't work. Like <laughs> exactly. this is entirely brand new, not just partially brand new. This is entirely brand new. Yes. Um. So yeah, I mean, I have, I've, I've now, like, I've, I've been stress testing stuff. Um, I've. You know, ran memory tests, I ran CPU tests, I ran GPU tests. I had the thing running two separate GPU tests on a on a stretched monitor, and and CPU tests at the same time. The, like the thing shot up to like the GPU shot up to like eighty five degrees Celsius, which is within its range. Like it's not yeah. great, but it's within its range. And like for well, being for a stress, stress test, that's pretty good. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, so this is this is fine. So like you know the of course the room started to get very warm. <laughs> yes, but yeah, basically it capped out and I, like it ran for four hours and wouldn't crash. But me like trying to edit a video or just close an application or things like that, <laughs> th- that is when my computer just it completely gives up. Maybe it's your mouse. Maybe your mouse is shorting short short circuiting <laughs> your USB bus. So if you try a new mouse. My, well, or so the mouse keyboard? is going through. The mouse is going to. I have a, a USB splitter. The Maybe that's it. To, it's a, no, but it's a powered splitter, so it can't be right. Maybe the twelve volt power line is like somehow spliced into the five volt rail and like shorting <laughs> out your USB uh, bus. I may. I I don't know. I don't. I know what some of those words mean. <laughs> that'd, be mean actually, that'd be actually. That'd be. That'd be hilarious, volt? though. So, so tr- maybe try disconnecting your hub and just plugging your mouse and keyboard in directly. Oh, no, I had, I had done that, too. Oh, okay. Uh, well. But no, I have everything going to a hub just because I have all of these yeah. various hubs podcasting devices and stuff. Yeah. Um, hubs are convenient. I agree. Uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Maybe it'll go away. The, the, the really frustrating thing for me is that, one, the error messages don't tell you anything at all. Well, 
Yeah. Unfortunately, I think you're failing at a low enough level that the system just dies and then right it, before secondly, it can figure out what's happening. All of the ways that people have come up with to try and force broken hardware to die, it won't die that way. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't just be like, okay, well, I'll just try and display like furry donuts on top of a psychedelic <laughs> wallpaper for a long period of time because that's what <laughs> GPU tests are apparently. Like that's apparently yeah. the most complicated thing you could possibly ask your computer to do. Like if you're just trying to like com like completely overheat and destroy the world, what you want to do is represent a fuzzy donut <laughs> in front of just like some 70s wallpaper. <laughs> you should have just Bitcoin mined. <laughs> well, like Bitcoin mining would have really true. done That's true. That's probably true. Um <laughs> Although that, I don't know if that, if I remember right, that actually didn't respect like the heat limits. Oh no, not at all. Um, you could whereas the, the stress tests that. do, like yeah. they'll just start dropping frame rates if, if they can't handle yeah. it. You, you, you can just completely set your machine on fire with ASIC miner or whatever. Oh, I agree. Was. Hey, yeah. I mean, you're trying to get the system to crash, you know, <laughs> melting into the ground. Well, no, I'm just trying to get some reproducible situation that causes these blue screen of death errors. <laughs> Um, so far, what I've determined is uh, scrolling Furry a little donuts. bit in Premiere. Okay. Um, closing a Windows Explorer window after leaving Overwatch. <laughs> okay. Like, it's I a finite state diagram of how to crash your computer. <laughs> this is the thing. Like, I can't, they don't happen, to, it never happens twice, but it's just like, yep, yeah, I'm dead for whatever reason. <laughs> So don't open Overwatch while we're having the podcast. Uh, yeah, That's well, no, I can open it. I just can't close it again. <laughs> well, okay. that's the thing. It's like you would think this is a this is my frustration with technology, Alex. Is that you would like it? Just it doesn't make any sense. Well, it makes sense at some level. No, it doesn't. You I think, think it does. Either like try all of like uh, like if it was like oh even at a, even at a low level like hey. There's some there's some broken cache on the processor. Well, how is it supposed to know that? That should no, but that should be testable. That should be, or the, I should be able to force it to crash that way. Prime well, ninety five would have caught that. It, it you have an intermittent problem, which is an issue. That's not no. That's not how that's not how electrons work. They're not like oh sometimes I'm broken, sometimes well, I'm not that's an how electron. Bad <laughs> traces on a circuit board work though. What what it, why? Well, because if it's a bad trace, maybe, like, depending on the current in the system, it could, like, short out from time to time. It's maybe there's two traces that are too close, and they just, like, arc every so often. But it's just, this is all new equipment. This should be easy. Well, I, I actually should, think new equipment is easy. the most likely to fail, to Why? be honest. Why? This isn't because fair. Because manufacturing defects... Well, don't manufacture defects. Stop manufacturing <laughs> defects, manufacturers. I, I, I okay. I, I, I will let every manufacturer that I'm in charge of know to stop manufacturing defects. I appreciate. It. I mean, but this is why you have a QA department, right? Yeah, but and at the very it's least, not perfect. At the very, you're right. But okay, let's. So you're you're making your graphics card, and you're like, hey, we're going to ship these, and ten percent of them are going to just cause random errors. Design your GPU. Such that if it does cause random errors, you can also ship some software that's like, here, here's something you can run to tell that this is one of the crappy ones. Like, at least but make things break in a way that's predictable and testable. I'm willing to bet the diagnostic buses are not connected to the PCI interface, so you'd have to connect some sort of, like, header to your graphics card to try to diagnose the system. They should build these things into the graphics card. Well, I mean, it if is they're built shipping the defective things, then they should ship the debugger things with the defective things. But they'd rather they they'll, they'll replace it for free. So they're just saying, just send it back, and we'll give you a new one. But no, they don't do that. See, this would be the thing. If I could figure out what one big piece of hardware was broken, then yes, I could complain to any number of vendors and get them to just give me a new thing. But I can't. I just can't do be it like, to all of them. <laughs> that would be a lie. That would make me the bad person in well, the story. Well, no, just say, my computer keeps blue screening. I am I have reason to believe that it might possibly be your component. Can you send me a new one? <laughs> there you go. Not lying. <laughs> it might possibly be their component. Uh, yeah, I don't think... I don't know. I'm not good. I'm not good with that. I just, I just, I want to know... 
I just I want to know why it's broken. That's all. I just well, I want to fix the like I'm not even I'm not even hire mad a that computer. It, I'm not whisperer. mad that it is broken. This is this is the thing. I'm not mad that the computer's broken. I'm just mad that there's no way for me to figure out how much like money to throw at it, where to throw that money, what to do to fix it. Like just I throw could, out the computer and buy a Mac Pro. <sighs> Problem solved. I'm dude. I'm having these thoughts today. I was like, you know what I could do? <laughs> just wait till wait till September. Because I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're gonna do. They're gonna do it in September. We'll have to see. But even we then, wills. it I don't know. Then you can't replace things, and then eh. well, you can. It's just harder than it is currently. Yes. Well, well, okay. But Alex, given how difficult <laughs> I have found Windows computers to be, do you really think I'm gonna be okay trying to upgrade my <laughs> Mac Pro? I've swapped graphics cards and iMacs before. It's not that. Hard. Yes, but your Windows machine doesn't blue screen of death all the time either. <laughs> So this is well, not an apples to apples true. comparison. That is true. Well, you could fly me out to wherever you live now, <laughs> and uh, at a rate of twelve hundred dollars a day, I can work on your computer. <laughs> there. Oh man, that, that sounds like a good use of everyone's time and money. Exactly. <sighs> all right, let's get away from this planet and all its computery problems. Yes. Let's go to a planet with no computers. A planet with no. Well, until yeah. There are no computers on this planet. And it's not even a planet. That's that is true. Yes. So um it turns out let's see. Okay, so yes, I, I yeah, I <laughs> I need to do a better job of show notes because I did not write the lead in for this. So there's an article on Gizmodo about Io's atmosphere and how it just exploded. Um so <laughs> it just happened. This is a really fun thing about people who write headlines. <laughs> they are the worst people. Except for people who make PC components. They're like the second worst of people. <laughs> so the inside the article, which of course I clicked on because I'm like, oh my god, IO's atmosphere exploded. I have well, to click on Well, we should probably explain what IO is. Well, who doesn't know what I... Oh, shame on listeners. Shame, shame on you on listeners. Shame on listeners. All right, fine. Knowing. Alex, you can, you, can have, uh, you can have remedial space teaching duty today. Okay, IO is a moon of Jupiter. There, done. All right, good job. <laughs> One of the many moons of Jupiter. So they wrote in the article that it turns out that every time Io is eclipsed by mighty Jupiter, which happens about two uh, for about two hours a day, the surface temperature plummets and the moon's sulfur dioxide rich atmosphere begins to deflate. So basically, so, it loses its atmosphere every day. I have many questions. The first of which is, what's a day? That is a very good question. That is, a, that, is a, that is an excellent question that sounds like a very stupid question. Yes, I know. I have absolutely no idea, and I've got to pull up the article and see if they say. I don't think they say. I mean, because there are so many potential days they could be talking exactly. about. Exactly. Because like, Jupiter's moons have moons. There's at least three. Right. So you could have, oh my God, so many days. There are three possible days they could be talking about in my mind. A Jupiter day, uh -huh. an Io day. Or an Earth Day. Well, no. So, because, no, more than that, because you've got the sidereal day. So, Earth has two days. Oh. Right? Oh, is so, that why we keep having podcast scheduling problems? <laughs> we've not... Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> that's that's true. But, no. So, <laughs> Earth has... So, there is, like, the human philosophical day. I then guess. there's the real freaking day. <laughs> there's the UTC day. No, that's the philosophical day. That's the human oh. invented one. The sidereal day is the real day. Okay. Uh, and then, and then, yeah, you've got the Jupiter day. You've got the Jupiter day that we would express in terms of our philosophical <laughs> fake UTC day. Then you've got the Jupiter day relative to Jupiter itself in its sidereal, based on its rotation. Then you've got IOs, both of those. So you have at least six. If I not would more. argue. That the, those pairings are close enough that you can just assume that they're the same thing. I don't think that's true on a on a large enough scale. I think by the time you're out of Jupiter, I think for it the article's more. sake, I believe. No, I think it could I, be. I think you could be talking off by like six hours or more. I disagree. I disagree. Okay. Disagree. Okay. 
does the article give any clarity to what sort it does of not day it does not at all <laughs> so this is just it's a good job choosing articles for the podcast Kevin <laughs> Okay, to be fair, I am the only person who chose any articles for the podcast. I have plenty of articles. <laughs> They're just not news articles. These are Wikipedia entries, Alex. These are not articles. Wikipedia articles. So, yes, Io's atmosphere is in a constant state of collapse and repair, and I should mention that the author is Maddie Stone uh, on Gizmodo, because I'm doing my best to try and make sure to give people credit when we steal things from them so that we can talk about them for random reasons. How can we... That was probably the worst time that to give credit to someone. We're like, this article <laughs> is terrible. Oh, by the way, it was written by Matt Easton. I think it's Gizmodo. probably fair to say that people who really do nitpick about what a day means when talking about IO... <laughs> yeah, are how did you even not... wind up on Gizmodo anyway? What's that? How did you even wind up on Gizmodo anyway? I don't remember. Well, d no, I, I think at some point I go to I go to Reddit slash r slash space. Oh, and I'm okay. like what are the news stories here? Uh, no, no, this wasn't one. No, this was this was a the, someone someone in my Twitter stream shared this one out. Okay. Yeah, because I'm sure the slash r slash space would have clarified would... what type of day they were talking about. Also, <laughs> I doubt they would have upvoted Gizmodo that much. Well, yeah, that's true. So. You know, but yeah, politics. so basically, their atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere on Io, goes away and comes back all the time um, because yeah. it is eclipsed by Jupiter. Yeah, Jupiter's gravity does crazy things to its moons. Like Europa oh, yeah. is like constantly under a ton of stress. Yeah, um, which melts the inside of its like ice core, so that the inside of Europa is this like hot water that is covered in a layer of ice because space is cold. And it doesn't have an atmosphere, and but Jupiter is just constantly churning the inside of it. See, space isn't cold though. Well, but space it's is just non-conductive because there's not stuff there. Yes, that's technically true. Yes, the but best no, kind of true. <laughs> but there's no atmosphere to like insulate it and keep any of that heat in, so it just right. all goes away, radiates outward. Well, but the ice presumably radiate, uh, presumably insulates a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's got like an ice a good atmosphere. Video, I think about like what if the sun disappeared? And he talks about yeah. Earth that basically it'd be very very cold, but anybody underneath like the first two inches of crust would be perfectly fine um, because yeah. you know the, the oceans would freeze over and therefore all would have liquid water pretty much indefinitely you know, for as long as we can imagine. Yeah, um, just because ice is such a wonderful insulator, and the core is such a wonderful here. Yes. So all that hot rock is hot, not because of the sun. And, you know, it, I, I, we're, we'd actually be kind of tied to the lifespan of the core anyway. I mean, if the core got too cold and shut down, then yeah. we'd have no magnetic sphere. And as we nah, discussed just, last, just, just last podcast, <laughs> as we discussed last podcast, <laughs> magnetospheres are important. Yes. For Alex's crazy schemes. It's not my screams. Schemes. <laughs> I mean, I'd be my screams about the schemes, but right. I'm not the one scheming. I'm just the one screaming. All right, that, that's fair. That's fair. I won't push you on it. Okay. I do sort Go of ahead. wonder, that, does, that, does that mean that, is there a, cause this is something I don't know, is there a Goldilocks zone <laughs> for moon? I mean, there is a Goldilocks zone for moons in the sense that there are places where basically it will either collapse um, <laughs> because of because of the... the uh -huh. Gravity tides um, yep. that will break up into chunks. And both of Mars's moons are in that. Uh, well, the problem with Mars's moons is that they're just kind of like a bunch of space junk tied together by gravity anyway. Well, yes. With so like a layer yeah, it's of not, dust. It's not like we're losing a ton to start with. But <laughs> um, but even so, they are close enough in yeah. that they will eventually uh, either be broken up or impact Mars, which would be, I think, a lot more fun. They're just going to get pulled apart because they're literally right. just like space junk covered in dust. Right. Um, but there is so there's there's that. And then there's also the range where eventually like you just aren't a moon. Mm. You're a passing comet. So yeah. there is a there is a Goldilocks zone there. But is there a Goldilocks zone for like semi habitability around a planet like Jupiter? Like are there some moons that are like, yeah, we're we're good. It's fine. <laughs> Probably where Europa is. That's probably the best. But you, you can just hope got for. done saying how terrible it was on Europa because of all of the tides. Well, what I'm saying, I wasn't saying it was terrible. I'm saying there's liquid water and relative exactly amounts of Awful. heat. 
<laughs> that is ve- like heat and liquid water are kind of like the great worst. things for life. <laughs> That's just humidity, Alex. That's just a recipe for humidity. <laughs> Nobody likes humidity. Humidity Ex- is the worst. Except for early and primordial life. Right, exactly. Thankfully, we have evolved past yes. that terrible I ag- taste. I, I'll agree. I'll agree with you that uh, we have evolved, thankfully, past early primordial life. <laughs> It'd be a much more boring podcast. <laughs> That'd be a very interesting podcast. Oh, it wouldn't be a podcast. It would be like a cell cast. Mm. Cytoplasm cast. Yeah. Uh, mitochondrial Prokaryo cast. cast. <laughs> uh, the the, the midichlorian ca- podcast. <laughs> the not, midichlorian no, podcast. No. That probably is a podcast, Alex. <laughs> it probably is. It's probably not what I'm thinking it is, though. Uh, no, probably, probably not. Uh, Speaking of your ability to think... <laughs> Okay, so this was your idea, I'll add. This was all your idea. No, no, no. This is this is entirely on you, man. Um I disagree. You started so, sharing stuff out on Twitter, I'm like, nope, this is this has gotta happen now. So I was reading through Wikipedia as one does. Okay. Because Wikipedia now, did is you great. Did you choose to read Wikipedia? I did. Or was it I predetermined? To. It w- it was not predetermined. Based that on I would prior read conditions no. that you it would could find not it's Wikipedia. not possible that it was prior determined based on well i guess suppose it is possible but i'm going to tell you why it wasn't prior determined <laughs> okay based on initial states of the universe okay so i was reading on twitter like you do and uh mostly trying to figure out how to time travel because that's something i like to do okay uh, is time travel um <laughs> And I came across the stunning realization that because closed time-like curves can possibly exist, determinism cannot exist. And we've had this discussion in the podcast in the past. Uh, we've where totally not talked about closed time-like curves. In fact, despite the fact that I spent many tweets rebutting you on this point, I still have no idea what closed time-like curves are. At all. No. So we've discussed free will versus determinism. Right. Um, and I've I've traditionally taken the convenient point of being for free will and Kevin has traditionally taken the point to be the for correct determinism. Point. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why it's again not correct for yet another reason today. <laughs> and that reason is closed time like curves. Okay. Which, so what are closed time like curves? So before I explain what closed time like curves are, I'd like to ask you a question, Kevin. Right, Do you does believe couchy surfaces? <laughs> I'm just looking we'll, at your we'll, list of Wikipedia articles, which I have no intent on clicking on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll get there. We'll get there. We have to. I, I need to establish something with you first, Kevin. So we, we've also had a debate of the EM drive versus the Alcubierre drive yes. for future manned spaceflight, and you have always been for the Alcubierre drive. Yes. So. Are you are you willing to re, right now reaffirm your support for the Alcubierre drive? I, um, I feel like I, I feel like somehow you might be trying to trick me into something here. I, I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to trick you into anything. I'm simply asking. Um, to the to, hmm. Okay, can I can I say yes, but only up to just below the speed of light? No. Yes. I mean, okay. I, so I mean, we use the I, LQB, I, I, I was like, yes, I that's ex- the way that we get to 0.99C. Because then there's no, like, causality fun <laughs> tricks that you can throw at me. <laughs> so, I... I mean, because that's, that's really the thing, is that it's not the speed of light, it's the speed of causality, right? <laughs> that's, I, I, that's really I, what the problem is with the speed of light. That's not why it's, it's not the light is the speed limit. It's that this is the fastest that anything can interact with anything else. And so if you that, go faster than that, the wonderful physics of information, which we still never really right, gotten exactly. into the meat of, but in this podcast. if we destroy it, man, it's going to get hot and humid. <laughs> but do you just, but so, but you're imposing artificial limitations upon the, the no, Einstein's. I'm, not. I'm saying yes, that the you know, are. drive could theoretically work, but not in such a way that violates causality. Okay, but that's not an Alcubierre drive. An Alcubierre drive is officially an interpretation of Einstein's field equations yes. that allows for faster than light travel. 
That specifically is what an Alcubierre drive is. Right, but there's nothing to say that there couldn't be some additional mechanic that prevents faster than light travel. So you could still use this super fast, let's move. Let's, right, well, you know, let's. That, that, the additional mechanic is called negative energy densities, right, and it's okay. built into the Alcubierre drive. So clearly. And Stephen you know, Hawking published in a 1992 paper uh, proof that it would require a negative energy density to break the speed of light. For someone who doesn't uh, agree with this technology at all and rather favors the EM drive of all things, you know an awful lot about the Alcubierre. I feel like I, I, I made a mistake by warning you that we should talk about this on the podcast because now you're just coming at me with both barrels of information <laughs> and science and research and I feel woefully <laughs> underprepared. No, Kevin, I'm just. I, all it was a simple question. I was simply asking for you to right now reaffirm your total <laughs> and complete support for the Alcubierre drive, <laughs> which you've been glad to give in the past. Uh, that's that is true. I have I have certainly been 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 glad to to give that support in the past. Um, oh. And fine, if it will move the conversation forward, I will reaffirm my all right never waving support. <laughs> Of the Alcubierre drive. Oh, Alcub- yes. Excellent. Okay. Now we're ready to cook. Okay. So, I feel yes. like I am in the frying pan, but okay. <laughs> and you're about to get out and into the fire. <laughs> All right. So, what, Alcubierre drives are, and we probably should have specified this before we had this like <laughs> 10 minute conversation about whether or not Kevin actually believes in the Alcubierre drive or not. But, you no, know, no, this podcast has never been organized, and I don't see any reason to start now. We're, we're getting better. We have bullet points and things. We've had bullet points the whole time. We have more bullet points now. We have more yes. sub-bullet points. Right. Well, no, we have, like, stories and segments that we try and move from. It's it's getting... Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, we can... At the very least, I think the two of us can be fans of the podcast, all right? Like, if I anything, agree. we have to have two fans. Come on. <laughs> okay. Is it too much to ask, Alex? I don't, you don't think even it have is. to edit the podcast. The least you can do is be a <laughs> is fan. Is be a fan. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right. All right. I'll be a fan. I agree. We have a pretty good podcast. All right. So, for this pretty good podcast, let me explain that Alcubierre drives are a method by which you could travel faster than light. Um, which is pretty much the only way we'd ever be able to leave the local group of pl- galaxies of which the Milky Way is a part of and explore the universe as the whole giant thing that it is. Right. Um, and it really is the more most practical way um, and really the only way that, like, in a single human lifetime to explore even, like, a, a single quadrant of our own galaxy. But, Alex, just if, if I may pause for a question... Mm-hmm. What about alternatives such as the EM drive? So the EM drive is great. Um, but even when you get up to things that are 40,000 light years away, which are there are plenty of interesting stars that are 40,000 light years away, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's great for things that are like closer than that. And it's super useful and super awesome. But it does have its own limitations. And that's where the Alcubierre drive comes in. And so what you're saying is handy. the Alcubierre drive is much more powerful than the EM oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, it's much more powerful and future technology. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. I just wanted to make make you reaffirm that. I, the- yeah. <laughs> sure. It is. It's much more power and much more flexible. I don't think we'll achieve an Alcubierre drive anywhere near our own lifetimes, but we could achieve EM drive technology. I don't think, I don't think we need any more of your pessimism on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point of the matter is, as long as we accept that Alcubierre drives can possibly exist, okay. um, and that they are admittedly, a very fast way of moving through the universe, um, we can talk about why they're so fast. They're, they're very fast because they exploit a facet of space-time. Um, and that was sort of the thing that Einstein came up with and that he's most well-known for, is that space and time are just two sides of the same coin and they're all this one big fabric-y thing. Um, and you can... Th- warp this thing using gravity. Um, and so the Alcubierre drive exploits that to warp the fabric of space-time to bring far away things closer. Right. Um, and so that way it can take a bit of a shortcut. It's not traveling faster than the speed of light in its own frame, but to 
a frame of another observer, it would be traveling faster than the speed of light, um, and which allows it to get very far places without ever technically going faster than the speed of light. Right. Um, and there's been no no mathematics thus far which has disproven it um, as a possibility. Um, it is very sound in the fact that it is a component of Einstein's field equations, which have been proven in multiple different ways at this point. I should mention this is as part of his general field equations. Special relativity would by itself would uh, be a little bit unhappy about a uh, Alcubierre drive, but mm-hmm. general relativity is more than happy to have Alcubierre drives be a thing. I bring this up uh, because... And as we all know, generals outrank specialists. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Generals are... You know, generalists. I'm a generalist. I consider myself a generalist. Right. And that makes me better than Kevin, who's a specialist, I guess. <laughs> in what sense? Am I? Okay. I don't know. You're a All specialist right. in beard technology. You have I'm a beard. T- generally incompetent, but specially <laughs> with technology. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, using an Alcubierre drive, you can therefore go faster than the speed of light. And this is where things start to get interesting because, as Kevin alluded to a little bit earlier, the speed of light is also generally to be observed as the speed of causality. Um, in that I, when I say something out loud or write something down on a piece of paper or gain new information about the universe and want to say it to someone, mm-hmm. the fastest I could possibly ever communicate it to that one in just a normal system would be the speed of light, like presumably using something like a, a radio or my voice but well, the voice would actually be the speed of sound. So like a flashing light, I could, I could flash Morse code with a flashlight and the closest you, I mean, the quickest you'd ever know would be when that light reached you. And then you could decode the Morse code and you know, there you go. You could have binary data right. and I could send whatever I wanted. When you can go faster than the speed of light, then that's no longer the fastest you can communicate information. You can send information to the other side of the galaxy thousands and thousands and thousands of years before light would ever reach it. Right. Um, which doesn't sound like that big a problem um, until you can, until you like actually read into Einstein's field equations and certain properties therein contained. Uh, the math. Wow. That was, the that math, was beautifully said. Yeah. The, the mathematics of it, I won't even pretend to try to understand, but the general principles. Oh, by all means, pretend. I, 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 I usually, I, I read, I try to read as much as I can, but I, 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 I'm not a mathematician uh, and I'm not a theoretical physicist, unfortunately. You don't have to do any of those things to be able to pretend, Alex. Uh, I am a I, specialist in pretending. <laughs> you need okay. no domain knowledge whatsoever to pretend to be competent in anything. I, I think I am pretending to be confident right now. This is totally me pretending to be confident. Okay. I don't need to go to the additional depth of trying to pretend the mathematics of how this all works. Um, but when you can violate causality using the speed of light, you can have events occur before their cause. Um, and, and that's where determinism comes in. So there are these things. If you think about the universe in terms of what is usually ca- phrased as the ca- a Cauchy surface. Um, and a Cauchy surface is really just what Kevin, Kevin looks extremely confused. No, I don't. I'm pretending to be knowledgeable. I'm nodding along. I, Ke- Kevin that looks was like not he's nodding. nodding along <laughs> with, as though, as though this were all information he had heard millions of times before. I mean, if you've hung around with me long enough, you probably would. <laughs> anyway, so a, a Cauchy surface is basically a Euclidean manifold with the added component of time. Oh, well, um, thank you. That clears. That clears. Okay, so Hibachi is Hibachi is just. Yeah. A, you want to go for steak? It's a blanket. <laughs> it's a blanket, okay. and the planets are like bowling balls. You yes, put on that a blanket. Is, yeah. Okay. So. So basically, this this smart French mathematician physicist guy um, came up with a way of just modeling the universe. Yeah. His name, his last name was Cauchy. Uh, okay, I, I, it's some Cauchy, C A U C H Y, Cauchy. Um, and so there's a couple of different components, but basically, you can think of a Cauchy surface as a a single frame of the universe. Um, so it'll have so like some a cons- slice. It, yeah, it's a slice. Like if of you take a ham, cosmic take a bread slice, time. If a, if a ham is the universe, 
and you slice uh-huh. it up into the thinnest possible slice of ham. Well, so that you would can't be even a... really taste it because it's too thin, and it's just why <laughs> even bother at that point. So that would be a couch, a, a, a couchy surface um, with a single with a T at um, on units of plank seconds. Why so do the you smallest possible time? Drink tea with ham. That just seems <laughs> so. Tea is time. Okay. So couchy cou- couchy surfaces get defined by a a unit of T. Um, so of uh, time. Okay. T. So T stands for time because it's the first letter of the word time. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. That's very I'm, common in physics. I'm catching up. Common. Oh, man. So much of physics is starting to make a lot more sense now. And, and why I specifically bring up Cauchy surfaces, because there are plenty of different manifolds, which can basically be Euclidean geometry um, plus the component of time. Um, a manifold being? And, um, so a manifold is basically just a way of representing space um, in which any point ne- on that manifold um, can be represented with a like a Euclidean model. So basically just like three dimensional space um, is on projected onto these things. Like you take a sphere, if you think of the earth and you take us yes. and the earth is a sphere. Um, it's if an you put, oblong sphere. Yeah. But I if think, you think about an don't, idealized, don't, don't talk down okay. to us. <laughs> an oblong spheroid is also like, you know, could also be said to be a Euclidean manifold. Okay. Um, because you could, you could put a point on it. Um, and then you could sort of map out all the space around that point, and then you could put it on a map, and you could have like a three D right. map of any space or in that point. Okay. Um, and so basically, you can do that for the whole universe, yeah. and that's and if you do that in third dim- in three dimensions, then you have a Euclidean manifold for the whole universe, um, and then a Cauchy surface is just a fourth dimensional version of that. Um, there, there are a bunch of different sort of ways of doing that there's like a so for those people who have a really easy time imagining the entirety of the universe in 3D right, space yeah. this yeah. is maybe like the next step the thing you want to practice right. yeah visualizing imagining four dimensions fourth dimensions right okay. and then and at that point you can start to trace your own world line through the uh through the geometry of right. the couchy surface okay um and you but couchy surfaces are important because they have this very interesting component that they are th- that the, their theoretical workings is that you can predict any Cauchy surface given any prior Cauchy surface, and you can okay. do this all the way back through time. Would it be fair to say that, like, to 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 super simplify this, to basically just say that a Cauchy surface is like a freeze frame of a movie? Yes. Okay, so it's a freeze and- frame, but of the entire universe. Right. The idea is that you can go and be like, hey, why is that ball falling? You're like, yep. oh, because prior freeze frames, yeah. it was higher or somebody mm-hmm. threw it or whatever. Right. And, and so the general principle is that you can predict any couchy surface news knowing the all the frames prior, uh, perfect knowledge of the frames prior to it. Right. Or the, the, the surface is prior to the, whatever T it's defined for. Right. Where this gets interesting is that part of this definition for a Cauchy surface also contains something called a Cauchy horizon. Um, and a Cauchy horizon occurs where it is no longer possible to predict the current or the next frame of the movie, given all the prior frames. And there are certain conditions which will bring up this particular Cauchy horizon. Like quantum uh, mechanics? <laughs> Uh, not really. So, like, actually. you're watching the movie, and then somebody puts a cat in a box, and you're like, "Oh no! Now we can't predict what's going to happen next." <laughs> this is this so, is the Cauchy horizon. So, this is the pro- the problem with this is that there we don't have a unified theory of gravity and electromagnetism and quantum mechanics, right? Um, because we just don't. It's a very hard problem, and so all of this these calculations are done on the macro scale, um, and all of this mathematics is based on somewhat ignoring. Uh, general mechanics. We have uh, what is it? Semi-classical. We have semi-classical gra- uh, models of gravity, which kind of work right. for a grand unified theory of all the f- major forces in physics. Um, the problem is that they break down for very, very high energy levels and very, very short periods of time, um, right. which we'll be which we'll be talking about very shortly as we just start to discuss black holes. Which okay. Which is one of the one of the <laughs> one of the ways where you could generate a Cauchy horizon, and a Cauchy horizon is the reason I bring up this this thing 
on Twitter. So I was reading about Couchy Horizons. Yes, Kevin? Can we have class outside? Sure. Open your window. Uh, it's too hot out. <laughs> what a silly question then, Kevin. I'm sorry. So I brought up Couchy Horizons on Twitter, and Kevin said we needed to talk about them on you the podcast. You did not bring up Couchy Horizons. You brought closed time like curves. Right. We'll talk about why I brought up closed time like <laughs> curves in a moment. So Couchy Horizons right. um, say that basically are breaking determinism because determinism states that given perfect knowledge of the beginning of the universe, you can determine everything about the universe. Right. And Couchy services agree with you until they hit to Couchy horizons. Okay. Uh, so therefore determinism can't exist because we have Couchy horizons. Do you accept this principle? No, not the way that you stated it. Okay. If Couchy horizons are a thing, Okay, this then, is what I... Yes, okay. determinism kind of falls All out right. the window. All right. So I knew, I, knew, I, knew, I knew you would object to it based on principle, because we have yet to prove exactly. beyond the shadow of a doubt that Couchy Horizons Especially are given thing. that you've already admitted that this whole Couchy model doesn't account for quantum. Well, but it... Yes and no. Um, it doesn't have to. It, it, it works in semi-classical gravity, um, which is is macro scale, and these are like macro scale occurrences mm-hmm. um, because we're literally talking about the, the whole universe. But no, 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 no. But okay, so if you were to, but e- even ignoring that, then naively knowing nothing about this, I would say the Cauchy horizon is the point where the amount of variance because of quantum effects becomes measurable on the macro scale. Is the Cauchy horizon? So, yes, we're saying, okay, we ignore that there's some little variations that we can't figure out with this model. Then I would say, well, then the horizon is when over a long enough period of time, those little variances accumulate to enough of a difference that you go, hey, weird, the sun is in the wrong place. <laughs> but, <laughs> right? but That would be the point where you go, oh, man, this is beyond the horizon of what we could predict because there are all these little things that are having these impacts that we can't measure. But a Couchy horizon, depend, like, depending on how a Couchy horizon occurs, it can happen instantaneously. So you could have perfect knowledge and everything be precisely where it's supposed to be mm. for every moment up until you hit suddenly a moment where it doesn't fit anymore. So it's not like it's a slow drift. Mm. It's like everything just suddenly stops fitting. Like on putting once. a cat in a box. <laughs> no. That, that, it's like that's, building the that's box. A, yeah, we can predict what's going to happen in the rest of the story. Like, oh, he's going to get some nails. He's going to hammer them in. And then, oh, he's going to find a cat. And then the cat goes in the and We're like, oh my God. Now, all of a sudden... Just like that, I have no idea what's going to happen next. Yeah. Like, Much like the rest of this conversation. What is going to happen next, Alex? <laughs> so what's going to happen next is that in order to prove that Couchy Horizons exist, we have to talk about closed time-like curves. Okay. And closed time-like curves are the whole reason I was I, I went down this whole rabbit hole in Wikipedia to begin with. Okay. Uh, closed time-like curves are what allows time travel. So time travel is when you basically follow a closed time like curve back in time. So remember how we were talking about the the, the flexibility of space time? Is when you fl- when a closed time like curve is when you fold space time back on top of itself into a closed loop. So okay. you can go f- go through space time and get backwards before you began. Right. Um, there are a few theoretical ways of achieving this. One of which, and is Part of the mathematics of the Alcubierre drive is by using an Alcubierre drive that can go in more than one direction. Right. Okay. So if you have an Alcubierre drive that you can go f- to somewhere and then back from somewhere, you, f- you by definition, will fold space time into one of these closed time like curves. Right. Okay. Um, and so once you have a closed time like curve, then you also birth a Cauchy horizon. And as the Wikipedia article puts it, a uh, CTC, closed time-like curve, therefore results in a Cauchy horizon and a region of space-time that cannot be predicted from perfect knowledge of some past time. And therefore, you no longer have determinism. Um, I think that you are rather limiting the scope of what determinism is. Why? So... I mean, basically, to simplify your argument into, as I do, like, 
standard sci-fi fiction tropes. <laughs> uh-huh. What you're saying is, like, if I go back in time and tell myself not to build a time machine. Correct. Nobody can predict what's going to happen. Correct. Which is which is fair. But we could also say that if I, someone with perfect knowledge of both the future time that folds, that is folded back, wouldn't be able uh, yeah. to make these sorts of predictions. So what you're doing is you're saying that determinism is entirely based on things that are that are pre you're 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 arguing that predeterminism can't exist ah i knew i knew this would come up but that i knew but that this with perfect knowledge up. of the future and certainly to the, those those loops those you know time travel loops you mm-hmm. could still make the same argument that there's no reason to suspect that um you wouldn't be able to figure out what was going on with perfect knowledge so a closed time-like curve, a single closed time-like curve in a single sort of world line is, I would agree with you, fairly predictable. If you if you know the entire geometry of a single closed time-like curve, mm-hmm. um, you could predict what was going to happen. Um, there are... F- You're predicting like infinitely open loops then? Yes. Okay. There are, there are, there are geometries of space-time that could be constructed using closed time-like curves in which events happen without a cause, future, past, or present. However, there's also reason to suspect that infinity can't exist because everything is quantized. So so there is... There, <laughs> infinity... I said yes because infin, like infinite oh, oh, closed time-like curves are a way of doing that, but there are non-infinite solutions to that uh, to that uh, those equations as well that Anything allow that's from- not infinite though could be tracked could be traced definitely uh, <clears throat> so I, I again i i this this is where i got sort of lost in the whole like mathematics and mm-hmm. stuff of it but there is a way to construct closed time like curves in which you have events occurring without a cause Okay, not, but here's not a future cause, not a past cause, so, without a cause. So here I have to go to the to the original argument that I began making with you on Twitter, that regardless of how this is justified, regardless of the mathematics of it at all, mm-hmm. if you ever have some sort of environment where you're able to make any sort of unmotivated, you you've you've somehow created some sort of situation where actions, choices, whatever are completely unmotivated. They in Mm -hmm. turn can't impact future decisions. That is determinism. Why not? So you could have a free choice, but then not be able to act on it or realize that you were thinking or do anything else because that is a consequence of having that free choice. I I, I don't follow this line of argument. And I I think this is why we relegated this discussion to Twitter. It just required a bunch of back... Well, you're, so you're creating like this magical fairyland where you can be like, oh my god, it's not a magical fairyland. <laughs> I don't even. I care. proved it with math. <laughs> you did not prove it with math. You proved it with some Wikipedia articles that you admittedly don't understand. <laughs> yes, but that come to the same conclusion Which that is I do. Magic. That- and there's nothing wrong with magic. This is the thought experiment reason for 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 disregarding free will. If you postulate some sort of environment where it is possible to make those completely free, unmotivated decisions. Events without cause. Then those events can't cause future things. But, so, you, I, and this is what the sort of why I, I don't follow this, is because just because one event happened without a cause doesn't mean it can't itself be a cause for a future event. Why not? Well... So imagine a baseball fell out of the sky from literally nowhere without cause, and I and I picked it up. It like that's gonna cause me to make decisions about like what now? What do I do with this baseball? Do I do I throw it away? Like th- there are but repercussions. You're, but you're postulating some some sort of space time bubble where there is no such thing as causality. So really, no, what happened is I'm like saying, a, a baseball starts to fall, and then a big brass brass band starts playing 76 trombones and then Alex moves to Canada and then Australia becomes a planet. And then like, this is, this is the sequence of non-causal space time. But no, I'm I'm not proposing. And of course, now that I have said that, 
that can't be what happens because then I would have been the cause. <laughs> what I'm no, what I'm proposing is where causality is not a law. So I'm not proposing a place it's not where a law, causality. Just a habit. <laughs> right. I'm saying I'm not saying that causality can't happen. I'm saying that it doesn't have to happen. Okay. That then there's no way for you to distinguish between the two events, though. I suppose there isn't. Therefore, there is no way for you to ever, and because you can't distinguish between, so, so, okay, yeah, so here we go. Here's, okay. now my thought experiment has come full circle. It works. Okay. So, you accept that there has to be some causality. There can be causality. Well, but for you to even know that you had a free thought, your, the happening of that thought would have to cause some sort of action in your brain or in your speech or whatever, yeah, okay. right? So there yep. has to be some sort of causality. Yes. Now, because there is some causality and some randomly manifested stuff, mm -hmm. there's no way for you to distinguish which is which. Uh, sure. Because there's no way for you to distinguish which is which, mm -hmm. you cannot claim with any certainty whatsoever that any of the decisions were free choice regardless of how possible it was. Uh, so you have no evidence at I, all I, that I, free I, will I, has ever taken place, even if it is not a rule. Uh, because there is no way for you to distinguish that unless you posit an environment where there is no causality, in which case you couldn't even recognize that a free choice had happened because that would require your free choice causing something. Okay, I disagree with your extreme of hypothesis. You're, you're, you're proposing that it's either all or nothing, one way or the other. No, I'm um, not. I'm just saying there's no possible way to know, and because there's no possible way to know, you cannot make the claim that it exists. I, I think there is a possible way to know. If you can prove that some events can happen without cause, not all events happen without cause. Like, and I'm saying a very limited number of events here. But how um, do you prove that the, that the thing happened without cause? Especially in an environment where things do happen with cause. So all you have to do is prove that it's mathematically possible and that these eight closed time light curves exist in configurations in which events can happen without cause. You do, Yeah, so you've established that it can happen. You've not established that it does happen. Well, but you can establish that it does happen. Once you... Mm, no, if because, you, if you, because you've also agreed with me that there are some things that happen in that situation that are caused. Right. So there's no, so how do you determine so you, you, that something You have to prove it beyond the math. What, what I should have said is you have to prove it beyond the math. So the mathematics allow for it. This, the step to prove that events do happen without cause is to have direct physical observation of these curves existing. Said observation relies on cause. Right. And I didn't say cause couldn't happen, but you can observe the existence of configurations that would allow for events without cause. But you would not be able to, un to gain total information of the system. Lacking the ability to gain total information of the system means that you can't rule out an unmeasured cause. But you can you because of the math. Have, if you can't have perfect knowledge... But we have perfect knowledge of the theoretical, which allows us, would allow us to predict with, with certainty, given certain configurations of closed time-like curves, where if events could happen without cause in the configurations we can observe. If events could happen without cause in configurations we observe because of the theoretical... Right, and just in the same way that we can say mathematically that the Alcubierre drive doesn't violate the, the laws right. as we understand them, that doesn't mean that, it, that an Alcubierre drive has ever existed. You have to but demonstrate to me that a free choice has occurred. If you test every component of a system, and if you test every physical component of a system, it, you, can, you can prove that if every piece works, that they'll work in conjunction. But you've said this is a situation without perfect knowledge. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean unfortunately, is, I, have, what you're trying, I don't what you're have perfect to, knowledge of the configurations. <laughs> well, this is the thing, is that basically what you what you have to demonstrate is that, like, so there's a car, right? And it's got a whole bunch of different components. Yes. 
The yep. car doesn't start. Yep. What you have to demonstrate is that the car not starting was a random event that couldn't have been predicted. And what your argument would be is, well, look at all of the parts of the car and see that they are all completely working. Mm -hmm. See that they are all, you know, to a to a molecule. They are absolutely 100% perfect and functional. And that and mathematically, this thing should work. The, okay. you know, the, the physics makes sense. The math makes sense. But because you can't have perfect knowledge about the entirety of the state of the car, you can't know that maybe there was one atom of uranium that got into the spark plug <laughs> you know, or some random mm -hmm. thing. So there's no way for you to say definitively that a free choice happened, that something happened that could not have been predicted given perfect knowledge because you can't have perfect knowledge. I agree that you can't predict that any individual event ha happened with or without cause. I, I, I will agree that for any given event, you can't prove it. I think that you can, and I believe the mathematics support this. Create a situation the, where it's theoretically possible. Well, create where statistically a certain number of events would happen. But it would be impossible to determine which events they were. Which is almost sadder than just plain determinism. Because, <laughs> like, man, that means, yeah, we can make some free choices, but they will be, they will necessarily be completely indistinguishable from all of the things that we just have to do because right. of our but that's what we But that's what we observe <laughs> in reality anyway. We observe that Not those decisions. Not necessarily. You can't demonstrate that. <laughs> I suppose no, I suppose not because I admit that you can't prove that any one event can be proven to be deterministic <laughs> or non-deterministic. But the point is once you mix in non-deterministic events the 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 systems will couple the regions of non-deterministic space-time will f bleed into other regions just by the butterfly effect. And so if really so the best that, but the best that you can really say is that it is incredibly probable in some situations that a free choice will have happened. Sure. Not that it is certain. And until it is certain, no, determinism wins again. But I, <laughs> we can be certain, we can be certain. if We can be you, certain we, that it is probable. <laughs> we. <laughs> I think we can be certain that it happened. N n well, it's not certain. We can be, we can... Claim that it is ninety nine point nine 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 percent probable. I, I I'm I, I'm actually fairly certain that you can claim it's certain, based on the existence of the once you could measure the existence of closed time like curves, you could be you could be certain that at least some number of events had happened without a cause. But of course, causality. none of this will happen unless we get our dang Alcubierre drive and demonstrate closed time like curves. So well, so gotta get working on that science. No, no, no come no, on, science. So, I I had you admit to the existence of the Alcubierre drive as an easy way to generate <laughs> closed timelike curves. Yes, because if because if, if closed timelike curves can be generated by an Alcubierre drive, there are other places they could be generated, and such as in Kerr black holes. So Kerr black holes are specifically non-charged, super fast rotating black holes, um, which are theorized to also have Cauchy horizons inside their event horizons, mm. um, and you could theoretically get non-deterministic events radiating out from every Kerr black hole in the universe, which would have plenty of time to couple in with our own sort of regions of space time. Hmm. I mean, again, not proven. And I don't think Kerr was particularly pleased with that, but you know, Einstein wasn't pleased with the results of some of his equations anyway. So who knows? So <laughs> we really, we should jump onto one more story just because we billboarded it at the top. This is the problem okay. with writing these introductions. Is the, and especially since I didn't twirl down and see that you had 87 Wikipedia entries <laughs> uh, listed here. And I was like, oh, man, I need to, yeah. <laughs> so so you were very confused when you read that intro then, because I added Wikipedia has unlocked the secrets of, well, you had something about I, unlocking the I said the Alex secret. has unlocked the secrets of. Uh, no, you said nothing. You said and has unlocked the secrets of free oh, will. Weird. Okay. So I added Wikipedia oh, because okay. that's where the articles were coming from. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well anyway, away. with free will successfully the champion of the day, let's move on. <laughs> All right. So uh, as as was predetermined by our, by our show intro, we're going to cover this story, Alex. 
This is from Popular. Awesome. So according to Jay Bennett on Popular Mechanics, Moon Express, which is just... This is Planet Express, but for moons, I guess. Um, yeah. A private spacecraft manufacturing company uh, just received permission from the Federal Aviation Administration to launch its MX-1E lunar lander to the moon next year, making them the first private space company to receive U.S. government permission to launch a, sat- uh, to launch a craft beyond the orbit of satellites. Mm. So, two questions. One, the FAA <laughs> reports to the White House, yep. not to Congress... Yeah. So it's not even that America is like, yeah, we own space, go nuts. <laughs> or we own the moon, go nuts. We give you permission. It's that the president said. Well, have you and ever not read even the... always the president, because sometimes the president's administrators aren't even like accountable to him in a weird way. Um, well, have you read like the interspace half treaty? Accountable to what's that? Have you read the Inner Space Treaty? We we have talked about the outer space the outer space treaty. Outer, yes. Not inner space, outer space the treaty. Space treaty. <laughs> Right. Have that you was, read- yeah, that was when they were all locked in, when all the ambassadors <laughs> got locked in an elevator in Geneva that one time. <laughs> they had a lot of extra paper. They were bored. They're like, yeah, you know what? Well, we need an inner space treaty. <laughs> yeah. So we've talked about the outer space treaty. The outer space treaty is very vague. Um, and basically all it says is that every member or like country will police or regulate its own um Things, its own companies, yeah. any, any representative of that uh, country will be regulated by the country. It doesn't say who has to do it. Right. Um, so I think it just kind of fell on the FAA because spaceships are kind of like planes, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, but yeah, it does bother me that this isn't a congressional thing. This is like just one of those. Well, Congress can overrule the FAA whenever they'd like. Yeah, but Congress doesn't do things. <laughs> well, but they, they can if they want. <laughs> um, so, the other, the other thing, though, what what is SpaceX doing? What do you mean? What is SpaceX? Lazies? They're going to Mars. They're skipping the moon. They're and going skipping directly the moon. That means we're gonna have yeah. So SpaceX is gonna have like their cool little SpaceX spa, but we're gonna have to pay these tolls to this crazy other Moon Express company. Just Why do to we get need to go there. to the moon at all? You gotta stop well, off at the moon. You don't have to. It's a it's, lot easier. It's easier if you pick up fuel there, sure, but right. No, because it's easy because then you get into the you get into the far Lagrange point, and then you transfer from the Lagrange point sure. to. But it's it's less expensive to just go to the Lagrange point and then leave and not go down to the moon first. Yes, but gen- but that's the, but the you can have stations around the moon. Yeah, you can dock up but, with and stuff. Yeah, the point but- is, companies staking out claims on much. Plus, what is this company even going to be? even going to be doing so it says that no u.s regulations are currently on the books regarding private space missions to the moon and beyond so moon express took it upon themselves to submit a formal request to the faa to approve its payload and uh they were like yeah go nuts so (laughs) yeah there's a big moon's big enough for a bunch of companies yeah but why it seems it's like i can sort of on it seems weird that you can do that and just be like we i want to have Alex, we should go to the moon. Okay. <laughs> I want to have stuff on the moon. It doesn't seem... So the company is... Let's see. You're just jealous. The, the, so you're just jealous that you don't have a company well, going no, so to the moon, So here's part of it as well. So you don't want anyone else to go to the moon because you can't. It says the company's, the company's contract with Rocket Lab includes two additional launches after the MX-1E. Moonex hopes to send future spacecraft to the moon to harvest resources, especially yeah. the helium-3, or, or specifically helium-3 that is abundant in the moon's crust. Yep. Why... Why did really like corporations ruined the internet and now they're going to ruin the moon? They're not going to ruin the moon. They ruined they're the internet, make Alex. Space flight cheaper they ruined for everyone. The internet. the internet isn't even a real thing. It's a concept and they ruined it. And now they're going to ruin the moon. I, they're going to go well, and turn the moon into like some, oh, we're going to drill for oil like out on the moon. They, they're talking. I, I welcome because it's helium companies, oil. If, if companies can ruin the moon, it means that interplanetary travel is so trivial that we can just <laughs> go to another planet and it doesn't matter. This just seems, I don't know. It, it seems, I think it's more that it generally seems, and, and to be honest, it bothers me with satellites as they currently stand. Yeah. It seems weird to me. that the Satellites are, don't stand, by the way. They, you know, are currently yeah, a state of free fall. 
Yeah, so they're screaming, ah! Yeah, it's like the, the downward part of a roller coaster, but just forever. Well, basically, <laughs> yeah. So there's no standing right. for a okay. satellite. Yes. But no, it bothers me the, the way that that's currently set up because these things are out there, potentially Kessler syndrome and an assault, preventing us from ever going out further into space. <laughs> we'll um, just use a Kessler ram and we'll be fine. It seems, though, that things like this should be the common domain of all humanity, if that makes sense. Sense like there's some flower, better flowery way to word that, but it right, seems weird to me I, that this is that the that you have things out there that shouldn't just be like this is all public domain. Like obviously you can't do that. You'd be like, hey, we're gonna have some nuclear spy satellites, <laughs> like and just out there. Anyone who wants in, just SSH in, go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> like it's public. It's it's open to everybody. Like you can't so, do that. But but sh- you know, sh- in there's a way to balance that with safety. I suppose, but like space is big, Kevin. Space is really, 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 really,